Good evening, and thank you for attending tonight's webinar, Optimizing Topography Capture for Specialty Contact Lens Design. My name is Angela Kasparik, Key Account Manager with Custom Craft Lens Service, the, the U.S. distributor for iSpace, and we are thrilled to have industry leader Randy Kanjima to provide this presentation. Randy serves as research scientist and clinical instructor at Pacific University College. He's also clinical advisor for Medmont Instruments. He lectures globally and is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry. There will be a short question session following the presentation. The question tab is located on the control panel to the right of your screen. Please join me in welcoming Randy. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for logging into our session on optimizing topography capture and using softwares like Custom Crafts iSpace. So how do we use this instrument with all of its points of data to build the most customized contact lenses that are available today? Um, that's the goal of this, this webinar. So let's begin. Now, iSpace is a software platform that allows you to import in various topographies. So various instruments are approved and linked with the iSpace software. And then within that software, you can build a lens in 3D space using these tier layer profiles to best align the contact lens to create the best relationship of rigid lens to corneal surface. So it's really the modern way to build a contact lens. Using any kind of nomogram that takes K readings just doesn't make sense today when we have the ability to use thousands and thousands of data points and then place a lens on in 3D space and then adjust for any areas that we want to soften the landing, any areas where we have excessive fluid or inadequate fluid. So this is really the best way to build a rigid contact lens. And I can tell you that almost 100% of our rigid contact lenses are built using some kind of 3D mapping uh, software like the iSpace to construct our irregular cornea lenses, our ortho Ks, and then of course any of our regular corneal GPs, multifocals and uh, single vision lenses. So one of the things that is hard for a practitioner who's never used topography to kind of get your head around is uh, key readings are, are really th that tool that we always think of as a starting point in a contact lens. And whether we use a keratometer or our auto refractor keratometer and we just take the K readings from that. And the truth is that most practitioners, even with their corneal topographer, still end up favoring the K readings as a way of, of building lenses. And this is one of the drawbacks of of our history is that we have always been trained to think of the eye as a flat and steep radius right in the center. And, and that's because keratometry values give us a very good understanding of the corneal astigmatism. They give us a very good understanding of the apex of the eye. And this is helpful when we have a normal regular cornea. But when we have any kind of irregularity or when we're constructing a large diameter, a more irregular type of shape, such as an ortho -K lens, it's not so conventional being flat, steep and flat or reverse geometry and shape. And you can imagine if we're using the K readings that are measured here in the center at three millimeters, what does that tell us about the apex of the eye? What does, it, what does that tell us about the peripheral corneal shape where our lens actually lands? And it's just as an example, this is kind of a simple graphic, but if you consider where your flat K and your steep K might be measured, we're talking about a very confined area of the center. Now, how many contact lenses do we fit that are actually three millimeters in diameter? And uh, at least I've never fit one. If we fit a corneal GP that's 9.5 millimeters, you get a sense of how much we are missing 
when we build our lens well past our area of measure. An ortho K lens is usually in the neighborhood of 10 and a half to 11 millimeters. So trying to build that reverse geometry shape lens using K readings is kind of limited in what we have for data to construct the lens. And then of course, for a scleral lens, it's extremely limited. K readings are, are almost useless in the building of a, a scleral lens. So topography capture is an important tool that requires us to understand the eye in microns of accuracy. We're going to build a lens using the iSpace software to this degree of finite accuracy that we could never do any other way before. So topography capture becomes absolutely critical to the, the entire process. Now, when we do any kind of corneal mapping, the goal is to get as much corneal coverage as we possibly can. Let's try to stretch out those rings or that area of data collection to the farthest reach that we can. And what that does is it takes all of those rings that are reflected off the cornea and each one of them has data points along them. So obviously the rings that are concentrated in the center will have the least number of data points and as you go farther out the more and more data points you're collecting along each ring. So all of those points are used to interpret the cornea's power, the cornea's shape, the cornea's elevation. And that's therefore used in the building of the lens when we're trying to construct a 3D built contact lens. So all of these data points are important to us. And you notice up here where the eyelash shadows are coming down, we're actually losing a few areas of data. And that's eliminating both the rings and linear sections of the ring as well. So do all you can to open up that fissure, get the lids out of the way, get the eyelashes out of the way, and that's going to help us to have as much information as possible. So the first consideration is the size, the area of capture. And ideally, we want to be able to image to the diameter of the lens we're constructing. If we're only getting eight millimeters of information and our contact lens is going to be about a 10 and a half millimeter ortho K lens, then there's going to be a lot of guessing by the software in order to build the lens. And our goal is to take out as much of the guess as we possibly can, or what might be called the extrapolation of the information. So get that largest diameter that you can. If I'm getting 11 millimeters, I'm pretty happy as a starting point. Now the various analysis that we're going to do with the software first is axial and we want an appreciation of how regular or irregular the eye is. The axial helps us to understand does this patient have great potential in the shape of the anterior surface to bend light? Is there a defined flat meridian, 90 degrees separated from a defined steep meridian? Is the inferior hemisphere a mirror of the superior hemisphere, the nasal a mirror of the temporal? Can we expect that when light passes through this anterior surface that it's going to bend itself appropriately to the retina? So that's your axial analysis. Your tangential analysis, we're trying to learn if there's any form of corneal displacement in a regular eye, in a normal eye. And in this case, if we're fitting a ortho K lens from the eye space software, we want to know if there's any natural corneal displacement. So looking at these contours or in the periphery where the lens will land, do we see any contours that appear pulled in one direction or the other? Or does this eye favor a more droopy inferior displacement? Those are the things that we're looking for to understand, is that likely to negatively affect the centration of our lens? Tangential maps are also used in keratoconic patients to understand the position of the cone, the size of the cone, the shape of the cone. So tangential is used for shape analysis. 
The elevation is used to understand height. So where your rigid contact lens will land hardest is where the eye has the most elevation. And that's the red that you see on opposing sides here at three and nine o'clock. Whereas the blue is where the elevation of the eye begins to drop or the corneal elevation is changing in a negative manner. So we're losing height. And that would mean that blue is where you should have pooling if we place a lens on this eye. So if we were to use a conventional single vision, uh, a spherical contact lens, it's going to land here across the hot contours, the high elevation. It's going to lift at 12 and 6 o'clock where we have the low elevation. This elevation map is the analysis that the iSpace software is going to use to interpret the appropriate contact lens for that eye. You need to understand height and as much of that height as you possibly can collect. So as an Example, most corneal topographers have their own indigenous contact lens software that allows you to place a lens on eye. The one downside of corneal topography software is that it's limited to the lenses that are available in their system. So iSpace, as an example, is its own software platform, um, which gives you access to all the various designs that are in there. So if you want to import a map into the iSpace software, then you have access to all of those lenses. But this is really the way to build a rigid contact lens today. We see the theoretical floor scene pattern imaged here, of course, with the landing where we see the dark and the pooling where we see the lightest green. But what I want you to focus in on is this white line here. This is showing you down on the graph what's called the tier layer profile. You must become a master of the tier layer profile when using contact lens software like a corneal topography platform or a iSpace platform. And what you're looking at is our edge lift at nine o'clock, then our landing, then the reservoir of the reverse curve, then your apical clearance, and then the other side of the contact lens. So by taking this axis line 360 degrees around, you begin to understand the lens to cornea relationship. Now iSpace allows us to import in various topographer um, maps into their system and they reconstruct the eye shape, the eye power, the eye elevation in their software so you can analyze the topography in axial and all the various um, interpretations that are done mathematically with all of that data you've collected. So once you've rendered that topography, now we can be begin the process of building a rigid contact lens from the software. So the iSpace is a completely independent third-party software, meaning that it's a platform that runs on its own and you will import in various topographies. In this case, you can see a Medmont E300 corneal topography has been imported and we've designed a Forge Myopia uh, Ortho K lens for that patient. Now, once you've taken that topography and you've selected the lens that you desire, in this case, the Forge Ortho K lens, it's going to build that same three, uh, sorry, that same theoretical fluorescein pattern. But this is where we want to stay focused, as we mentioned earlier. It's looking at the tier layer profile. So to get your bearing, the corneal surface is right along the bottom of the x-axis. So that's your corneal tissue. Then where you see the blue, that's where the lens is in touch with the epithelium. And then of course, we're looking at the tear layer profile or what you might call the tear layer thickness. Lens close to the corneal apex with that deep reservoir of fluid to create our ortho -K effect, the hydraulic force that gives us the central corneal flattening excuse me, and the paracentral steepening. Then of course we need the alignment with the peripheral cornea to stabilize the contact lens. And like any RGP lens,
we must have our edge lift to allow tear exchange, to allow for movement onto flatter surface of eye, and also to have something for the lid to grab onto to pop that lens off. So you're looking at the alignment of the lens across the flat meridian, across this meridian of the eye. And you see also on the theoretical floor scene, the blue indicating the areas of alignment with the eye surface. Then 90 degrees separated, you see your steep meridian and notice the lens just lifting a hair above the, the surface of the eye. And that would be at this point and down at this point. And the idea being we want some fluid layer along the steep axis to allow for good tear exchange, good tear pump movement when the patient wakes up in the morning. So this is that platform that we use to build um, all kinds of specialty contact lenses, all kinds of rigid lenses. And this is really a fabulous way to construct rigid contact lenses because instead of taking the central K readings at three millimeters, we're using thousands and thousands of data points all the way out to the periphery. So we understand how much depth this contact lens needs. We need to understand the alignment with the peripheral cornea and the edge lift. And all of that is gained by building it directly from the topography and not the K readings. So whether you're using the corneal topography software that your instrument has, or you're using the iSpace software, you need an accurate first to topography. It, the outcome of our initial lens is going to be, be based wholly on the quality of that topography. So I can't encourage you enough to spend the time taking really good pre-fitting topography maps. That will determine how successful you are right off the bat. Now, a good capture really starts with putting the patient at ease. And it, it, it's in fitting uh, an adult patient, obviously they're a little more comfortable with instruments coming toward them, but they're used to the puff test. They're used to um, instruments that may be invading their space. So explain to them that this is really just a camera we're gonna bring the camera close to your face, but it's not gonna come anywhere near your eye. And that's especially important when we're dealing with children and we're doing uh, pre-fitting maps in orthokeratology. Uh, often the kids can be as young as six years old, seven, eight. And the research that came out of Hong Kong Poly showed us that younger patients tend to have less accurate topographies. And it's because they're moving around, they're fidgety, they don't like us bringing this instrument toward them. So communicate clearly that all this instrument does is going to take a photo. Generally, they're quite calm for that capture. Now, the con next consideration is how much coverage we get. And you see with this image on the left, we have a real problem with the lids uh, covering much of the superior cornea and a portion of the inferior cornea. Uh, on the inferior side, you've got this huge tear film wedge that's limiting the reflection of the rings off the ocular surface. So we need to get rid of this huge lacrimal lake down here and just pulling down on the cheek is one way you can move that lake out of the way. Now the upper lid is also a problem covering much of the superior cornea, but then you see these long eyelashes creating shadows across the surface. So that is really giving us a very small area of information. As an example, if this is the flat meridian of the eye, if it's a truly with the rule cornea, we don't understand our landing here at three o'clock. We may understand the landing at nine o'clock. If we're trying to build a toric lens for an astigmatic eye, we have no understanding of the depth needed where the lens will actually land in the vertical. So get the eye open as 
wide as you possibly can. And here is what we see as an, an ideal capture where the lids are out of the way, we don't have any tear wedge, we have some eyelash shadows, but we've minimized them to the greatest degree. So that's what we have to try to achieve with each capture, especially if we're trying to use a platform to build the lens 360 degrees around. Now, another consideration when you're using a reflection based instrument, a topographer that reflects rings or data points like LED topographers, you need to be able to understand the tear film. And what these reflection based instruments do is they reflect off the tear film and not off the cornea. So if you have tear film breakup, then you're gonna have a problem understanding the underlying cornea. Now this image isn't so good because the lids are in the way, we've got some eyelash shadows, but if you look at the rings, the rings actually look pretty good. They're parallel and even. So we need to open up the fissure, but the actual tear film looks good at the instance we took this capture. Now, when you compare that to this one, if on cursory glance, you'd say, well, this looks pretty good, but if I zoom in on the center, you'll notice this is ring number one, two, three, four, and then five, six, seven, eight, and a little bit of the next few begin to break up and distort. So what's happening is either we have staining on this cornea, like some generally it's scarring that causes the uh, placido to distort, but it, it could very well likely be just tear film breakup. So make sure at the instance you capture your topography that the rings are reflecting in a smooth, parallel, and even manner. When you capture your topography photo, you don't want to do it immediately after the blink. You want the tear film to even its way out. We don't want to wait more than four or five seconds after the blink because the tear film is going to begin to destabilize. So ideally, if you can capture after a second, but before you get to four seconds, that's kind of the sweet spot in most eyes. Now, of course, if we've got a patient with a two second tear foam breakup time, we don't have much of a window to get that capture, but you get the idea. Try to find that instance in between the normalizing of tear film and the degrading of the tear film to get your capture. Now, here is an ideal topography um, a photo keratoscope image, an ideal topography capture. Now what makes it really good? And one of those things is we've got lids and lashes out of the way. We've got rings reflecting to the far periphery. The central rings especially look good. And that's important because the topographer uses what's called an arc step algorithm to build the eye shape, elevation and power from the center to the periphery. So it begins with an understanding of the apex. And if you have error in any of these central rings, then that's going to create a topographical error for possibly the entire topography. So those central rings are the ones you're most picky and critical of. Now, the topography that's created by that image is this one, and I similarly believe this is a good topography because if you look at all of these contours, they have this smooth and well-rounded nature to them. That indicates to me that we're seeing the normal, steepest to flattest corneal uh, nature that exists in a healthy normal eye. We should see all of these contours looking well-rounded. If we see a sudden red spot next to a, a cold spot or a steep next to a flat, that's not very normal in a healthy normal eye. So that tells you there could be topographical error. But here we're seeing smooth, well-rounded contours. I'm feeling pretty confident. Now have a look at this topography. This is your pre-fitting corneal topography and would you be happy with this map? Does this look like a normal capture? Well, one of the problems is we are using one single topography and not multiple maps. 
we, when we take a photo of the eye, it's at one instance. Is the patient steady at that instance you take the topography? Is the tear film in flux at the moment you took that topography? You really don't know because you have a reference of one to choose from. So really what you want to do is take multiple images. And you see here how we have four very different appearing topographies. There aren't any two that look the same. And that's very concerning because if we don't have any reproducibility, what are the chances that we have any accuracy whatsoever? So this is what we want to see is reproducible topographies. Each one of these maps appears the same. The astigmatism in the center appears similar, the corneal coverage, the way the eye flattens from center to periphery, these are very reproducible captures. Now, I don't know if they're 100% accurate, but I at least know that they're reproducible, and that gives me some confidence. Now, one of the things that's required by the iSpace software is a well-centered topography. And I want you to take a look at this capture. What do you notice that's a bit odd about the appearance of the rings on the cornea? Would you agree with me that the contours appear to be pulled toward the nasal side? This is a right eye. So notice your final rings here and even some of these outer rings have spilled on to the conjunctiva, whereas on the temporal side, the rings end on the cornea. So our topography appears to be decentered on eye to the nasal side. And of course, that has everything to do with the temporally displaced fovea, the angle alpha, that exists in the eye. When our patients look down the axis of the instrument, on the visual axis, they're fixating slightly out. So that results in a topography capture that's always skewed to the nasal side. And when you build a lens in 3D space, from a topography that's skewed to one side or the other, that makes it very difficult for the contact lens software to predict the appropriate landing of the lens. And that's seen here, where on the temporal side, we have a lens that looks like it touches down appropriately, but the software's saying that that lens needs to dive into the surface, it needs to sink below the epithelium on the temporal side, which of course can't happen, but the topographer is trying to deal with the fact that all of this data in here is exceptionally flat all of a sudden, whereas on the temporal side, it's dealing with much steeper curvature. So the problem really exists that we have not centered the topography to the geometric axis. Now, how do you do that? Well, when we have patients fixate down the axis of the instrument, they're really on this point here in the middle of the topography. They're fixated on the center ring. And because of our temporally displaced fovea, that results in the rings, the ring reflection being skewed, as I said, to the nasal side. If we ask the patient to look one, two, three, sometimes even four rings to the nose, then that pulls the topography toward the geometric axis of the eye. So what you're going to do is have the patient start out one ring nasal and look to see if the placido has left the conge and moved on to the cornea. Does it look balanced on both sides? If not, then go to two rings. If not two, then three. If not three, then four. So change their fixation. Patient always looking in or looking nasal. Now here you see a geometrically centered topography where the rings aren't spilling onto the nasal aspect. They're about equidistant from the visible iris diameter to the last ring on this side as they are on this side. So this is what we want for iSpace software is this geometrically centered capture so that when we build the lens, we're going to construct it in relationship to a well 
fitting, well-centered contact lens. When you think about how you evaluate all your contact lenses through the slit lamp, of course, we never know what the visual axis is. We look for centration in relationship to the visible iris diameter. And the same thing is true when we construct the lens. We're assuming the eye is symmetric in shape, and therefore we should be building the contact lens off a symmetrically captured topographer. So here's an example of a right eye where we have a visual axis capture on the left-hand side. Notice the rings hitting the nasal side. You can always tell which is nasal and temporal in your visual axis captures because you get the blue, the flatter contours, always on the nasal aspect, and then the steeper contours on the temporal side. Now, if we better center this capture, if we geometrically capture, then we have the rings appearing laterally well centered to this eye. And then when you look at that same topography, you'll notice the blue appears about equidistant from the center of the capture. So we've now moved the topography onto the geometric capture of the eye, and we understand this eye doesn't really have a lot of lateral displacement. Whereas if you look at the visually ax visual axis capture, you'd presume the contact lens is going to hit itself into this flat nasal cornea and be driven temporal because the eye is steeper on this side than it is on this side. But the truth is, this eye is a pretty, um, a pretty symmetric eye laterally. You might expect a little bit of inferior displacement because the eye is steeper down below than it is above. But those are some of the things you're looking for. Now, when we import into iSpace a capture that's not geometrically centered, and you can tell which eye this is, right or left. And of course, this is a left eye because you see all the blue on the nasal side, and then the cornea is steeper on the temporal side. So this map was not optimized on the geometric axis. Now, so what? I've, I've made a big mistake. I've imported it into iSpace. Does it really matter? Well, let's look at the Placido, and we see how it's closer to the nasal side than it is the temporal side. So when I build my contact lens, it's going to be in relationship to this slightly nasally decentered topography. Whereas um, if we were to better center it, we might not have the issues that we see here on this screen. What I want you to look at is your tier layer profile. And let's take the meridian where we have the landing. And you'll notice that you've got the lens diving in on the one side, but lifting off on the other, hitting here, but missing or not quite landing down on the opposing side. So the software has to struggle with the fact that we have an eye with tilt. The eye has far more blue or high elevation on the one side than it does the opposing side. So let's take out that error and make it easier for the software to build us an accurate first lens. Whenever you see this kind of tilt in the flat meridian of the lens, that's concerning. That tells me that maybe my topography has error, so I have garbage going into iSpace software, or I have a topography that isn't well centered to the cornea. Let's import another capture. This time we have a map that is slightly better centered laterally, but we still see a lot of blue on the nasal side. And then more concerning is there's this hole in the center of the topography. Now, you are familiar that the cornea is generally steepest in the center, so we shouldn't have a central divot or this, this flat spot in the center of the eye, unless this patient has had some kind of corneal molding, some kind of contact lens that's altered the shape, unless we've had some kind of surgical procedure or if there's been some trauma to the eye. But this was a normal, healthy patient, so there's no reason 
for us to have this flat spot in the middle. This is just a bad topography on my part. It's poor in terms of its central ring data and it's poor in terms of its lateral centration. When we look at the Placido reflection, you notice rings very close to the nasal side on this left eye, missing all of this temporal side. So again, I didn't center the topography very well. But I want you to look at the central rings. Look how parallel and even they look. So I may have captured that image at an instance where the tear film was smooth. We didn't have tear film breakup, but the tear film wasn't even. And that's the challenge of using reflection-based topography is you need smooth and even tear film. So I may have captured this image immediately after the blink before the tear film had evened itself out. And that's what gives us this false, this divot in the center, this hole in the center of the topography. So this is why you want to take multiple captures because this may have just been one bad capture in among three other very good captures that showed normal with the rule astigmatism with the apex being flexion here the centration may be a hair better than our previous case but definitely decentered to the nasal side so this is not a geometric capture now again when we pull in a visual axis capture or an image that isn't on the geometric axis, you notice the tilt. We're hitting on the one side of the eye here at four or five o'clock, but on the opposing side, our contact lens is hanging in free space. It hasn't touched itself down. It hasn't aligned. And that's again because the software is struggling with this very irregular surface that we've placed it on. So by taking a better topography capture, I probably wouldn't see the flat meridian landing down on one side only. Of course, a rigid contact lens will hit the highest point and find the opposing highest point always along a similar axis. So this clearly there's something not right when we look at the tier layer profile of both the flat and the steep meridian. Now, what about this capture? Are we happy with this topography? Um, and the first question I might ask is, is this a right or a left eye? And really, I can't tell looking at this topography. It might be a left eye. It looks like a little more blue on this side, but you notice how similar the width of that blue is on both nasal and temporal. You notice that the steepest portion of the eye is much closer to the center of the grid. So this is a much better captured geometric uh, uh, photo of this cornea. Now when we look at the placido reflection, we see the rings relatively close um, on this side, about the same distance on the other side. So I've done a much better job of putting the placido reflection on the center of the topography. However, I want you to look at a bit of the distortion in the placido right in the center. That's the kind of thing you wanna avoid. You want those rings to reflect parallel and even, smooth as they can be. Now again, if I look at the periphery of those final rings, I'm pretty happy with the centration of this topography laterally. This is what you would call a much more geometrically centered topography as opposed to a visual axis capture. Now when we build a lens from this map, now you're noticing the more balanced landing at three and nine o'clock. And that's a dead giveaway right away that when we're fitting the regular cornea and we've placed a lens on in this 3D environment, that we have the appropriate landing of the, the contact lens, that the software isn't struggling with weird height elevations in the eye surface. We get an even reservoir depth on both sides and an even uh, tear layer depth at the lens edge. Then on the steep meridian, that also gives us the ability 
to calculate the appropriate depth that will give you that tiny finite little tear layer to allow in this steep axis good movement of the lens, good tear exchange, but enough of a relationship, enough depth to better match the surface so the lens doesn't decenter, so the lens isn't moving excessively and the lens wouldn't be uncomfortable. Now, all of these concepts that we've talked about have really been related to ortho K lenses, but this is true of any corneal GP that we might design a lens for. We want good quality topography for all of our rigid contact lenses, not just the ortho Ks. The ortho Ks tend to be a little more sensitive because you're trying to build a lens with 10 microns of apical clearance, seven microns of apical clearance, it's ultra close to the eye. So we have to get this depth correct. But in a conventional corneal GP, a single vision or multifocal, we're looking for more like 20 microns in the center. So we have a little more room for margin of error. Now, when you compare the three of those, you see the difference in the placido position and also you see the difference in the captures. I think this is actually a good capture if we were looking for an image on the visual axis. But for iSpace, we want an image on the geometric capture. This one in the middle is really the worst of the corneal topographies because we have that divot in the center. But related to building of the contact lens, it's this one that we're the happiest with because we have that geometric capture. And that scene, when we pull up the iSpace software, notice one acute side where the lens will land down. Again, one acute side where the lens will land down, but with the same eye and a geometric capture, now we're seeing the arcuate areas of landing that we really would expect in a symmetric cornea. So providing a good landing is not just the flat meridian. We also need to consider the depth in the steep axis and understanding the topography where the lids may be in the way is a important consideration. Trying to get them out of the way so the appropriate toricity can be built into the lens and this lens is looking like it has really an ideal steep meridian relationship where you see that tiny fluid layer along the steep axis of the lens. That gives that contact lens very little room to tilt back and forth with the lid interaction. Gives that lens very little room to be able to decenter because the lens to corneal relationship is relatively close. That lens should be on center. That lens should be relatively stable, which should increase the comfort level. So when you look at this topography, I want you to focus in on the type of astigmatism we're dealing with. Clearly, it's a with the rule cornea. The steep meridian runs vertically. So if we were using K readings alone, we'd be looking at the central corneal sill and how much is it? Let's presume in this case, it's, let's not presume, let's measure it's one and a half diopters of central corneal astigmatism. But that's not where a rigid contact lens lands. A rigid lens is going to land in the mid periphery of the cornea, somewhere out here. We want to understand what is the shape in the periphery. And if we were to look at the red at 12 and 6 o'clock and the blue at 3 and 9 o'clock, we see that this eye is both astigmatic centrally, but also astigmatic peripherally. And that means that this eye is going to have a fair amount of depth across this meridian. It's going to be much deeper vertically than it is horizontally. And that will require us to construct the lens appropriately for that depth differential. Now, what the iSpace software does that's brilliant, it does it automatically is take into account the toricity that exists in that peripheral cornea. So I'm going to just blow up this section of the main window to give you an appreciation. Now, we said that the key readings don't matter as much as what the periphery is, and that's true. 
But just for a second, let's look at this eye relative to a spherical cornea, and K readings are still that useful tool. So we have a flat K of 4366, steep K 4518, a differential of one and a half diopters. So number one, we know we're not dealing with an incredibly toric eye or an incredibly stigmatic cornea. It makes this a very good candidate for ortho K. We know we're dealing with median radius I. That also makes this a good candidate for ortho K. But I want you to focus on this sag differential right here at nine millimeters. So what the iSpace software does automatically without you needing to do any work is to calculate the height difference between the flat meridian and the steep meridian. Notice it's registered that you have a 40 micron toricity. So in other words, you have a one and a half diopter central corneal astigmatism. But where the contact lens needs to land, you have a 40 micron difference between the height of the eye this way and the height of the eye this way. And 40 microns is a fair amount. In the iSpace software, when you have greater than 32 microns of SAG differential, that's where the software will automatically kick in a toric lens, a steeper, steep meridian relationship with the cornea to help create a better landing 360 degrees around. And this is a very valuable piece of information. That's one of the initial things that I always look for when I'm beginning any type of rigid lens fit. Ortho K, single vision, multifocal rigid. I want to know what the sagittal differential is, where my contact lens needs to align with the eye surface. Now, with the iSpace software, one of the ways to be successful is taking good maps. And I know that sounds so fundamental, but really, if you import in good quality topography, then the iSpace software has an easy time building the lens in 3D space. So that it, I cannot stress enough how important that is to have good quality corneal topography mapping. You want to take your visual axis capture for vision. So when you're analyzing the pre and post outcome of your orthokeratology treatment, you want to use the visual axis. But when you're building a contact lens right in the beginning, you want the, vis the geometric capture. That's what will work most favorably with the iSpace software. It is happiest when it has a geometric capture. So in case that didn't make sense, we're using the geometric axis capture to build a lens. But when we're analyzing the outcome of ortho K, we want one baseline map, at least one good baseline map on the visual axis. And then our post-treatment visits, post-wear, are going to be on the visual axis as well. Because we want to understand what is our effect in the eye based on the visual axis and where the pupil is in relationship with the visual axis. We want to build our contact lens from the geometric axis. Now, how do you do that with, ax, sorry, with the visual axis versus geometric capture? Real simple. You notice on this left eye, the rings are hitting the nasal side. So I need to ask my patient to change their fixation from the center moving their fixation in so that the placido reflection pushes its way out. So generally, if, the, if you have a normal eye with a temporally displaced fovea, the patient's fixation always needs to come in toward the nose. And that can be one ring, it can be four rings. You want to start with the one ring fixated nasal, then check if the placido appears laterally centered. If it doesn't, then go to two rings. If it doesn't still at two, go to three or four. So visual axis capture is very simple. Patients just looking right down the axis. Geometric capture is also simple. It's just we need to 
find how many rings nasal does it take to center that placido reflection. Make sure that you have quality ring reflection, that the rings appear parallel and even. Make sure that you've got good coverage from superior to inferior, and that's what's going to give us the most data points to send into the iSpace software. And then with that quality capture, one that you see here that's geometrically centered, that has smooth and well-rounded contours, that's what is going to make the iSpace software the happiest. Now, the team at Custom Craft wanted to acknowledge um, Bausch and & Lomb and the uh, Boston Lens Materials for sponsoring this session. And we'll happily take some questions now. Darren's going to join me and help me as, as the expert when it comes to both iSpace and the lens construction of a rigid lens. He is really the guy that uh, has the answers. So if there's any questions, we'll happily take them now. Yes, Randy, we have quite a few. So if you give me a moment, I will bring them up. Um, and you and Rand, you and Darren can work together on answering them. The first question is, do you recommend any type of lubricating drop to use if you're having a difficult time getting a good map? Boy, that's such a great question and it comes up with, uh, with a lot of frequency. So obviously people are paying attention to the fact that we're reflecting rings off that tear film. And I generally don't use artificial tear routinely because I don't want to load up the eye with fluid. I don't want to create, let's say, hills or mountains in the eye surface that aren't actually there. But definitely when we're struggling with a millisecond tear film breakup, it's really all you can do to try to smooth out the tear film. I'll, I'll try things like having the patient blink really hard and trying to squeeze some mybum out and getting something across the anterior surface that'll keep the surface from drying out so fast. But if a good hard blink doesn't work, if blinks relatively quick don't work, so maybe every two, three seconds, um, trying to get a capture in that narrow window, if that doesn't do it, then really you're right, using artificial tear is the way to go. And something, lastly, sorry, something um, thin. So you don't want a really thick, viscous fluid. You want something thin that won't create shape that isn't actually there. <clears throat> Okay, and the next question I think would be directed towards Darren. Um, they would like to know whether they need a MedMont or an Oculus to use the iSpace software. Another great question, um, and the short answer is no. We can uh, teach you how to go in and empirically create a map using K readings, but as Randy suggested earlier in the presentation, when doing that, you uh, lack the benefit of using the elevation data that the MedMon and the Oculus topographers provide. Thank you, Darren. And there is a question, is it possible to decenter the treatment zone? At this Darren? time, oh, go ahead, Randy. No, I was gonna say, did you wanna field that from an iSpace perspective? Yeah, at this time, um, it, it, it's not possible, but once we have the confidence of the topography being centered uh, with the majority of our users, then that may be a feature that's introduced. I, I was going to say that there there have been case reports of decentered treatment zones being created, but boy, that isn't a very complex lens construction and um, I, I'm thankful that I can say I haven't needed that too often that um, more often than not it's just enlarging uh, the treatment area that often is all we really need to do to reduce the aberrations that might exist but at the, definitely that's an, an exciting advance that one day we're going to be able to move our treatment zones anywhere that we want to, and and of course, not everybody has a normal a normal um, angle kappa or angle alpha, and if they have an exceptionally high or an exceptionally low value, then really it would be beneficial to to have that. But boy, Darren, how often do we 
run out of um, ability to modify the treatment zone in patients. I, my feeling is it's pretty rare that we have real issues with where that treatment zone is. I would, would concur, it's exceptionally rare. It, it's not uh, that we don't have the technology to do that, but again, if we make the software open up that uh, ability, then it could lead to problems that we didn't anticipate. So I would suggest if anybody feels the need for that, if you contact me directly, we can work with the iSpace developers and create a lens that has that because the, from a technological standpoint, we certainly have the ability to. Thank you, Darren and Randy. The next question is, uh, does the iSpace software only include ortho -K lenses? Certainly not. I'm glad you asked because a lot of our practitioners that, that seek us out uh, are familiar with our ortho -K product, but we also have a, a gas permeable, a, a daily wear gas permeable design, the bespoke, which you can get in a toric or a, a spherical design as well as a, a product that they've had uh, in their other markets, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa, which is a toric lens. Uh, and they've had that for over five years and we had to have our laser certified before we could begin manufacturing it uh, in the United States. So stay tuned because that should be uh, coming your way soon. Thank you. And is the iSpace software free to use? Absolutely, there's no charge for the software. And in addition to, uh, using the iSpace product, you get an extensive knowledge base as well as brochures that uh, you can use for the initial consultation as well as when you dispense the lenses. And these brochures are provided to the practitioner at no charge in electronic as well as printed uh, format. Terrific. And what do you find is the best way to get the biggest capture for a patient with smaller eyes without getting in the way of the quality of the image. Do you want me to field that one, Darren? Yeah, I think you're certainly uh, qualified as the expert in the field. You know, there's it's so often that we're fitting ortho K on kids, it's probably 98% of the time. So of course, we're gonna be dealing with smaller fissures. And then we add on top of that, so many of our myopes are Asian and with small fissures. So how do we address that with any type of topography capture? And, and um, the way you do that is when you really are limited by the patient's ability to open up themselves, um, then you have the patient bring their chin in, forehead tilted back to a degree. So what you're doing is you're trying to push the lower lid up higher so that the upper lid is landing somewhere higher up on the cornea. So to compensate for that, you're gonna pull down or ask the patient to just gently pull down on their cheek. So you've moved by bringing the chin forward, forehead back, you're pushing the upper lid higher up on the cornea, giving you more superior coverage. And then in the inferior, although the lower lid is covering more cornea, you can pull that part back. And if the patient can still blink normally, which they can in such a case, then the tear film generally is, is is going to be okay and of course if we're dealing with kids their tear film is always uh, wicked good so it, it usually isn't an issue but that's one of the ways you can open up the the fissure another way that you can do that is if you really are struggling with that upper lid then if you could get a second set of hands involved a technician or a colleague then put the instrument in position and with a small cone topographer, like the instrument you see on the screen right now, it comes relatively close to the orb. And once the instrument is in place, have your second set of hands pull up on the eyebrow. And just dragging up on the eyebrow is often enough to get the upper lid a ways out of the out of the road and then we get a few more rings, a few more data points and sometimes we can even get 100% of the superior cornea. So it really can be a helpful a helpful way of getting more information. I think that's a great tip and I think I just saw uh, 50 or 75 of our attendees doing, practicing that to see if it actually works, but it does. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, next question. To confirm, we get the geometric center by looking nasal for the initial design, 
but to track ortho K, all subs subsequent measurements should be taken on visual access looking straight ahead? Question mark. Thanks. Yeah, so I would take at least two images. If we're going to do ortho K, I take two images on the visual axis, and those are going to be used as a reference when you see the patient moving forward. So when you do your what's called subtractive map, you always compare today's visit to the baseline visit that was a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, whatever it is. So you need your baseline capture on the visual axis because you're going to compare pre, post, and the difference map in relationship to the visual axis because that's what ultimately the patient is looking through. So we want to appreciate what does the topography look like through that the, the patient's line of sight. But when you're constructing the lens, you want to take a bunch of maps on the geometric capture. So you might take uh, four maps on the visual axis and four maps on the geometric, pick your best one, and then you can delete the others. Once you get the fit started, once you're, uh, you're comfortable that you have good quality topography. So when in doubt, take plenty. Take boatloads of pre-ortho K maps, and that way you're assured that at least one of them has to be good. And by having both the visual axis and the geometric axis, then you've got an understanding of the vision and an understanding of how to build the contact lens. Hopefully that makes some sense. Thank you, Randy. Does getting a geometrically centered map make it easier for constructing both an ortho K as well as a corneal GP or only an OK lens, an ortho K lens? I'd say definitely both. Darren, your thoughts on building a conventional GP? I concur. That uh, I agree with you that it's uh, best for, for all types of, of lenses uh, to have that capture uh, to utilize. Really what sure. we want to understand is the topography in relationship to the visible iris. The same way that we would analyze the fit of the lens through the slit lamp, it's always going to be in relationship to the visible iris. So assuming the eye is a normal symmetric eye, we should really be taking our topography data off the center of the topography, not with the topography skewed off to one side. So. I'm a huge proponent of all, uh, taking a geometric capture whenever you fit a rigid contact lens because uh, virtually 100% of the lenses we design at the university are all based on that, um, based on some kind of fitting platform like iSpace. Thank you, Randy. For the initial topography, do you prefer a composite image or a single central topography? Also, for follow-up captures, which do you prefer? I think that was already answered, but... The composite is a great image to have as your baseline map, but iSpace prefers a geometric capture rather than a composite capture. Darren, did I get that correct? Absolutely. What we found, initially we were recommending, years ago we were recommending a, a composite, but what we found is that the composite quality is degraded if you have one poor map. And so what that allows the practitioner to do if they use a composite and you have a lid in the way uh, or, or a, a large tear meniscus inferiorly, it can uh, detract from the overall quality of that composite. And so you've spent a lot of time and, and gotten a map that, that may uh, not uh, do what you were hoping it would do. The composite is a great uh, feature to fill in and understand all of the eyes. So as your baseline capture to do your subtractive, your subtractive maps, um, as your always baseline reference, the composite works really well as a tool and I always use it when I, when I can get good imaging. Um, but as Darren said, for iSpace, that perfect geometric capture may be all you need in that environment. And then post-treatment, you don't ever need a composite capture because the we're really only interested in the action through the pupil for the most part. So we don't need information out to the limbus. 
Thank you, Randy. And I think that pretty much wraps it up for tonight. Um, I, I really appreciate you staying over a little bit and answering these questions for us, Randy. We are going to be able to have this available for those who ended up joining a little bit later. We'll have the recording online and I will send an email out to everyone. We also will make sure that all the attendees will get an email with our brochures. And if you have any questions, the our email address is in the comments section of the control panel. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you. And thank you again, Randy. We, we truly appreciate it. Hey, thanks to the Custom Craft team. It's been fun. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone.